The weapons of legend, myth, and folklore have captured imaginations for a long time, and for good reason. They ignite our fascination and intrigue our inner warriors. In the annuals of history, there exist weapons of unparalleled power and mythic prowess, and just hearing about them will make you feel ready to battle dragons and rescue princesses. Get ready to embark on an epic history through time, with these magnificent blades will reveal their secrets and unleash the echoes of battles long past. Sharpen your senses, for the legends are about to come alive. These are the 20 most legendary swords that actually exist. Number 20. The Double Swords of Mewar. Pratap Singh I, also known as Maharana Pratap, was the king of Mewar from the Sisodia dynasty. He is famous to this day for having participated in the Battle of Dewar and the Battle of Haldigati. Now, many people fought in such battles, so what made the king of Mewar so special? Well, he was incredibly tough. Not only did he resist the expansion of the Mughal Empire, but Maharana Pratap was easily one of the strongest warriors in the country. He was over 7 feet tall, weighed about 240 pounds, and carried about 790 pounds of weight. A lot of that weight was the two swords that he always had with him, each weighed about 55 pounds. Known as the Double Swords of Mewar, he had good reasons for carrying two at a time. Whenever he came across an unarmed enemy, he would give them one of the swords to ensure an even fight. Carrying two swords was also an excellent way to intimidate his enemies. Maharana was a brave warrior, so you might assume his untimely death was related to being killed in battle. Well, he actually survived every war he was in, and instead, died while hunting. He had an accident while tightening the string of a bow with his arrow. Now it's time for the odd topic. We bet you've never seen a sword like this before, unless you're really into anime and RPGs, that is. That's because this is the mysterious sword that no one is allowed to touch due to how valuable it is. A few decades back, this mighty blade was found mysteriously abandoned halfway up a Japanese mountain. It has fascinated experts, since, as aesthetically, it simply does not match the style of most Japanese swords, yet the rust on the blade, since repaired, implied that it was ancient and had had been there for some time. The sword remains a mystery and a fascinating piece of possible Japanese folklore. As always, let us know your thoughts in the comments section down below using the hashtag OddTopic. Number 19. Roman Sword we long believed that Christopher Columbus was the first non-indigenous person to arrive in the Americas. We then wondered whether the Vikings, Chinese, and Polynesians had come before him. But what about the Romans? Researchers found a Roman sword off Nova Scotia on Oak Island, and they now theorize that Roman ships visited North America at least a thousand years before Christopher Columbus did. Jovan Hutton Pulitzer put together a paper detailing how the sword is the smoking gun. It was a ceremonial sword from a shipwreck and, in his words, an incredible Roman artifact. Researchers also found carved stones, a Roman legionary whistle, and a Roman head sculpture. Many mainstream historians say it's not uncommon for modern-day collectors to drop artifacts, and the sword and other artifacts weren't necessarily brought by the Romans. According to Jovan, they performed many analyses on the sword, including X-ray fluorescence. This helped them to determine that it contained arsenic and lead, the same as what's been found in other ancient Roman artifacts. The sword had been recovered from a fishing boat decades ago, but the founder kept it a secret due to laws in Nova Scotia relating to treasures taken from shipwrecks. The finder is now deceased, and the relatives came forward to researchers with the sword. Number 18. The Sword of Tipu Sultan Tipu Sultan was the ruler of the Kingdom of Mysore in South India. He was also known as the Tiger of Mysore and was well known for having introduced a new calendar, coinage system, and land revenue system. He was also a rocket artillery pioneer and deployed rockets during the Anglo-Mysore Wars against British forces and their allies. However, he's also well known for his sword, which is now considered one of the rarest artifacts in the world. Tipu's sword has a single edge 
and is made from fine steel with a curved blade. It also has an oval grip, short quillings, small langets with a gold and floral design, and a small knuckle guard. Perhaps the most standout detail of this sword is the inscribed steel blade, which features verses from the Holy Quran. It also has Tipu Sultan's name on it, along with his capital, known as Sri Ragatapatanam. The wooden sheath of the sword is covered with a beautiful maroon-colored velvet. Tipu lost his sword in 1789 during the Battle of Nedum Kota in a war with the Nairs of Travancore. The British forces took his sword and a ring he wore as war trophies. The sword was kept on display in the British Museum of London until 2004 before liquor tycoon VJ Malia purchased it at auction for 1.5 crores, which is around $200,000. Number 17. Grammar Sword If you're familiar with Norse mythology, then you'll be familiar with the Grammar, or Gram, sword. It means wrath, and it's the very same sword that Sigurd used to kill Fafnir the dragon. There have been multiple mentions of the Grammar Sword, but very few information sources actually provide a clear description of what it looks like. All we know is that it's gleaming bright, gold, and might also have a dragon on it. The most popular story relating to the Grammar Sword was from the Volsunga Saga. In this legend, the sword was used by the Volsungs. As the story goes, Sigmund receives it during a wedding feast for his sister. During the feast, a man appears with the sword. The man is a stranger, but he's later revealed to be Odin, the god. He thrust the grammar sword into the barn stoker tree in the middle of the hall and said that the man to pull out the sword from the trunk would receive it from him as a gift. He also said that whoever holds it will never bear a better sword than it. Many men try to pull the sword out and all fail except for Sigmund, who easily pulls it out. King Sigir offers Sigmund three times its weight in gold to own it, but Sigmund refuses. The king becomes angry and plots to steal it. The king kills Sigmund's father and captures Sigmund and his brothers. Sigmund's sister manages to give the sword back to Sigmund secretly, and he uses it in several battles until Odin breaks it during a fight between Sigmund and King Lingvi. Sigmund's wife, Hjordis, takes the two halves and keeps them for their son. Number 16. Napoleon's Austerlitz Sword Out of all the swords you'll see photos of, Napoleon's Austerlitz sword is probably one of the most beautiful. Napoleon carried this intricately decorated sword in the 1805 Battle of Austerlitz. In this battle, French forces won against Austrian and Russian troops, who were sent to destroy Napoleon. This victory by Napoleon paved the way toward masking the defeat of the French Navy in the same year at Trafalgar. The very special sword was made for Napoleon in 1803 by goldsmith Martin Guillaume Bionnet in Paris. He already owned many swords, but he called that one in particular his sword, and it's the only one we really associate with him. It has a solid gold handle with a portrait of Napoleon and scrolling foliage, a steel blade with gold foliage and a blue background, and gold leaves painted on it. The blue tint came from heating the blade over burning charcoal to achieve a silvery blue color. Interestingly, the sword was never created for fighting, even if it was sharp enough to cause some pretty horrendous bodily damage. Instead, Napoleon had it made to symbolize his rank and show him off as the Grand Ami Supreme Commander. Number 15. Muramasa Swords You'd be forgiven for thinking Muramasa swords are just like any regular katana. They sure look like it, but the stories behind the swords set them apart. Muramasa swords are Japanese katanas believed to be demonic and cursed. Some people also think they are the strongest katanas ever made. While many legends relate to Muramasa swords, some stand out more than others. There's the story of Muramasa Sengo's bloodlust, in which the infamous swordsmith Muramasa had an awful rage. He tried to contain it by making the sword, which is how people came to think the sword was cursed or evil. Other stories talk about how Muramasa swords were made in haunted locations, but that might not be accurate, since many came from the free trade port city of Kuana. There are even stories about their mysterious charm. 
Some people think the very first Muramasa swords ever made were so beautiful that they played with the wielders' minds and made them power hungry. At the end of the day, though, they really are just katanas. They have straight wrapped handles, circular guards, curved blades with wavy patterns, and normal looking scabbards. Number 14 Sword of Kusanagi the Sword of Kusanagi, or Kusanagi Sword, is basically a sword made from a snake, kinda. From the Japanese legend, the snake-like ninja Orochimaru retrieves the sword from his mouth. He opens his mouth, extends a snake, which opens its mouth, and presents the sword. The sword came out handle first so that Orochimaru could immediately grab it without cutting himself and attack his opponent without delay. As you might imagine, a sword like this is no ordinary weapon. It can extend and retract its blade quickly to attack from long distances, and Orochimaru can even control it telekinetically. Perhaps the most absurd feature of this sword is its transformation properties. It can turn into a small snake and return to Orochimaru. Now, the sword is, of course, fictional, but you can purchase replicas of it with hand-forged carbon steel. They come unsharpened, which means they aren't battle-ready and are purely ornamental. Sadly, they also don't turn into snakes. Number 13. Sword of Osman the Sword of Osman was a sword of state that sultans of the Ottoman Empire would use during enthronement ceremonies. It was named after the Ottoman dynasty founder, Osman I. The Sword of Osman girding ceremony would take place at least two weeks before a sultan would ascend to the throne, and it became a tradition when Osman I was given the Sword of Islam by Sheikh Edabali, his father-in-law and mentor. The girding was held at a tomb complex in Ayyop, Constantinople. Until the late 19th century, all non-Muslims were prohibited from entering the Ayyop Mosque to see the girding ceremonies. It wasn't until 1909 that people of different faiths were allowed to attend. Mehmed VI's girding ceremony was the last ever held since he was the last reigning Ottoman Sultan. Now, the Sword of Osman is in Topkapi Palace and can be found in the Imperial Treasury section. Number 12. Christian III's Sword Christian III was the king of Denmark and Norway from 1534 and 1537, respectively, until he died in 1559. When he reigned, he formed ties with both the church and crown and established Lutheranism as the state religion. He was also the very first king of Denmark, Norway. His sword, known as Christian III's Sword of State, was a beautifully ornate piece with a gilt silver grip and scabbard, table cut stone, and enamel. Goldsmith Johann Sieba made the sword for Christian III in 1551. It was the very first piece of regalia to be given to the king after the introduction of absolutism in 1660. It was used for the last time in 1648 during Frederick III's coronation. After that time, an anointing sword replaced it. The anointing sword was gold with table cut and rose cut stones and enamel. It was used by absolutist kings and possibly even Frederick III himself. It's believed that Christian III's sword and other Danish royal regalia are kept within the treasury at Rosenberg Castle. Christian III's sword is the oldest in the collection. Number 11. Sword in the Stone of San Galgano. If you happen to be holidaying in Tuscany, Italy, take a trip to the Cistercian Abbey. Here, you'll be able to see an extraordinary relic, the Sword of St. Galgano penetrating through bedrock right down to the hilt. The sword in the rock confuses people to this day, but there's a famous story about how it got there. The story follows Galgano Guidotti, the son of a minor noble born in 1148. He was a bit of a troublemaker, to say the least. But one day, the archangel Michael appeared and showed him the way to salvation. The next day, Galgano told his family that he would become a hermit and live in a cave. Everyone ridiculed him, but his mother told him to pay one last visit to his fiancée. On his way to see her, his horse reared and threw him off. An invisible force lifted him to his feet and a voice guided him to a rugged hill called Monte Siepi near his hometown, Custino. He was told to look at the top of the hill and that's when he saw a round temple with Jesus, Mary, and the apostles. He was then told by the voice to climb the hill. 
Upon reaching the top, the voice then told him to stop living his life so loosely and easily. Galgano said that that was easier said than done, and about as easy as splitting a rock with a sword. Galgano wanted to prove his point, so he thrust his sword into the rocky ground. Somehow, the blade went right through the bedrock to the hilt. Galgano got the message loud and clear and became a humble hermit, living an impoverished life, befriending animals, and being visited by peasants requesting blessings. Number 10. Sword of Gushien if you were to find a sword dating back 2,000 years old, you'd likely find it to be hardly a sword at all. It would be rusty, degraded, and no longer suitable for use. And that's why the Sword of Gujian is so famous. When it was found in a tomb in China, the 2,000-year-old sword was so well-preserved that it looked like it could have been made today. It didn't have an ounce of rust. Archaeologists had been conducting a survey in Hubei province, just four miles from the ruins of Jinan, when they found 50 ancient tombs. In these tombs, they discovered 2,000 artifacts, with the most special being the sword. The sword had a decorated guard, a straight, double-edged, 18-and-a-half-inch long blade, rhombic patterns, and a straight, round pommel. There were also two columns of ancient writing on one side of the blade closest to the hilt, which translated in English to I King Gujian Self-Make-Use Sword. That would basically mean that King Gujian fashioned and ordered the sword. It was found in an almost airtight wooden box next to a skeleton, and both the bronze sword and scabbard were perfectly preserved. Later tests also found that the blade was still so sharp that it could cut a stack of 20 pieces of paper like a knife through hot butter. The sword is now considered state treasure and is kept at the Hubei Provincial Museum. However, it's no longer perfectly preserved. In 1994, it was loaned out for display in Singapore. A workman removed it from the case at the end of the exhibition, knocked it, and caused a small crack. After that, it was never loaned out again. Number 9. Wallace Sword If you decide to visit the National Wallace Monument in Stirling, Scotland, make a beeline for the Wallace Sword. It is a striking, antique, two-handed sword believed to have belonged to Scottish knight William Wallace. He led a resistance during the Wars of Scottish Independence, resisting the English occupation of Scotland. He supposedly used the sword during the 1297 Battle of Stirling Bridge and the 1298 Battle of Falkirk. It's quite an impressive sword without even knowing how it was used and the battles that made it famous. It's 5 feet 4 inches long, has a 4 foot 4 inch blade, and weighs a whopping 5.95 pounds. When William was executed in 1305, the governor of Dumbarton Castle, John de Menteith, obtained the sword. However, there are no records to confirm this information. In 1505, 200 years after his execution, records were found to suggest that King James IV of Scotland paid an armorer 26 shillings to bind the sword with cords of silk and provide a new handle, plummet, scabbard, and belt. Some sources say that the original belt, handle, and scabbard were made from Hugh de Cressingham's dried skin. Hugh was the English administration's treasurer and was killed at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. To be fair, if I knew a sword was made with bits of someone's skin, I'd be having it remade with non-human materials as well. No more was heard of the sword for at least 300 years before the War Office sent a letter to the Tower of London in 1825 asking for it to be repaired. Number 8. Sword of St. Peter To be honest, the Sword of St. Peter doesn't really look like a sword, but it was definitely used as one. It's believed to be the same one the Apostle Peter used to cut off the high priest's servant's ear around the same time Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane. As far as swords go, it's pretty unremarkable. It's 27.6 inches long, 3.7 inches wide at its widest point, and features a single piece of iron with a small cross guard. It also has a broad tip, almost like a machete, and is displayed as a holy relic in the Poznan Archdiocesan Museum. There's also a replica at the Poznan Arch Cathedral Basilica. We first learned about the Sword of St. Peter in 1609. It arrived in Poznan in 968 as a gift for Bishop Jordan or Duke Mieszko I from John the 13th. 
Written records suggest St. Peter used the original Roman sword in the Gospels. In 1699, the Poznan Cathedral Archdeacon wrote about the sword and said Bishop Jordan brought it to Poznan and that it was kept in the cathedral treasury. It was only ever taken out a few times to show people. But British folklore differs. Some sources report that St. Joseph of Arimathea brought the sword to Britain. It was then kept in Glastonbury Abbey for several years until St. George received it from the abbot. Number 7. Odachi Sword If you're a passionate sword collector, an Odachi sword is definitely one you'd like to have in your collection. They are traditionally made Japanese swords used by feudal Japan's samurai class. In order for an Odachi to be classed as such, they have to have blades measuring at least 35.8 inches long. Making these swords was quite challenging since they had to use traditional heat treatments. The longer any knife or sword blade is, the more difficult and expensive it is to make. Still, they became popular during the Kamakura period from 1185 to 1333. Men who wanted to show off their honor of being a warrior would use Odachi. They also increased in popularity for those who didn't have horses or adequate bow and arrow training. However, as they were so long, warriors would carry them on their backs or make their servants carry them. After all, pulling such a large sword from a scabbard on your waist wasn't exactly practical. When Japan became a peaceful place during the Edo period from 1603 to 1867, Odachi swords weren't really required as weapons. That didn't mean they dropped in popularity altogether, though. They became offerings to the kami of Shinto shrines. Number 6. Zulfikar Sword the Zulfikar sword would have to be among the most unusual swords in existence. It starts off looking like any double-edged sword, but has two blades at the end, almost like it began transforming into a pair of scissors. The name Zulfikar means cleaver of the spine, which is probably quite an accurate description of what it's capable of. Some people believe the sword came to exist when Allah sent it through the angel Jibrail or Hazrat Muhammad gave it to Imam Ali. Some records suggest the Prophet Prophet Muhammad prayed for help during the Battle of Uhud, and the sword was sent to earth to help him. During the Battle of Uhud, Hazrat Muhammad was attacked on all sides by his enemy. Hazrat Ali defended him and ensured all infidels were sent to hell. That was when Angel Jibrail descended and praised Imam Ali's bravery. The sword was supposedly inherited by Imam Ali's elder son and has been handed down countless times until now being in the possession of the 12th Imam. Mahdi. Today, the Zulfikar sword is one of the most well-known items in Islamic history. It's believed to be about 9.8 feet long and weighs 231 pounds, but the accuracy of this information regarding the original sword is not known. You can buy replicas of the Zulfikar sword online, but these are about 35 inches long and weigh 3.3 pounds. Number 5. The Harriet Dean Sword the Harriet Dean sword doesn't look like much, but looks can be deceiving. There's a reason it sold at auction for more than half a million dollars. It's one of the last remaining swords from the Alexandria Arsenal and was originally purchased by Bashford Dean, an American zoologist and medieval and modern armor expert. He bequeathed the sword to his sister, Harriet Dean, in 1928, and it was sold at auction when she died in 1943. No one knew where the sword was for more than 70 years years until it was put up for auction again at Christie's Auction House in 2015. It sold for around $550,000. Bashford Dean would have acquired the sword during a tour of Europe and Turkey in the early 1900s. He purchased swords and armor from the Military Museum in Istanbul during this time. A similar sword with the same inscriptions, maker's mark, and date was bequeathed to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York in 1928. This sword now forms part of the Bashford Dean Memorial Collection. Number 4. Seven-Branched Sword 
A normal sword can be damaging enough, so imagine fighting with one with seven branches. It looks kind of like a cactus, and the seven-branched sword is described as a ceremonial sword gifted from the King of Bekia to a Yamato ruler. It's a 29 and a half inch long sword made of iron with a central blade and protrusions coming off it. It's so precious that it's not on display for the world to see. However, it's tucked away safely in the Isonokami Shrine in Japan's Nara Prefecture. The sword is as unusual as they get. The blade itself is 25 inches long, and it has a 3.7 inch long tang. A tang is the back portion of the blade where it connects to a handle. However, there isn't a hole on the tang, which means there's nowhere to attach a handle. The seven-branched sword is also broken at the top of the tang. As it was likely made of forged mild steel, it was probably quite delicate. Its delicate materials likely would have meant it was for ceremonial use only rather than for battle. Number 3. Tizona Sword Tizona is the name given to a sword that Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar used to carry. Rodrigo was a warlord and Castilian knight from medieval Spain who once fought with Christian and Muslim armies. He was born in the village of Vivar. The Tizona sword was given to the Count of Santa Esteban de Lerin, Pedro de Peralta, by Ferdinand II of Aragon in 1470. For a number of years, it was kept in the Marcia Castle, but was later moved to the Army Museum in Madrid, followed by the Museo de Burgos in Spain, where it's been since 2007. It's believed that the sword is quite powerful, but its power depends on who has it. It's supposed to frighten opponents who are unworthy of it. It's 36.8 inches long, weighs 2.5 pounds, and has a broad blade with an elaborate curved crossguard. Number 2. Sterbiet's Sword the Sterbiet sword is famous not only for its beauty, but also because it's one of the few pieces of Polish regalia remaining. During the final partition of Poland during the end of the 18th century, Prussians broke into the Wawel Cathedral's treasury and stole nearly all regalia kept there. Once they had their spoils, they returned to Berlin and melted them down. Very few pieces survived this horrible act, but one of the few that did was the coronation sword known as Sterbiet's also often referred to as the Jagged Sword. It's believed to have been owned by the very first Polish king, Bolesław the Brave. However, its first use was during the coronation of Władysław Lokietek in 1320. When the treasury was stolen from in 1794, it ended up in the possession of private collectors and finally made its way to the Hermitage Museum of Leningrad. When Polish antiquities were returned to Poland from Russia after 1920, the sword went with it. it was sent to Canada for protection and was returned to Poland in 1961. Since then, it has been housed in Krakow at the Wawel Castle. Number 1. The Isle of Man Sword the Manx Sword of State is a beautiful two-edged 29-inch steel blade with a hardwood hilt and steel pommel. It's a ceremonial sword representing the Tinwald on the Isle of Man and is used annually during the Tinwald Day ceremony. Over the years, three swords were used for this function. One is in a museum, one was lost during the 18th century, and the other is used for ceremonies. These swords of state date back to the middle of the 13th century, but they didn't start gaining popularity until around the 15th century in England. The Isle of Man sword symbolizes Tinwald, the legislature of the Isle of Man, and the oldest continuous parliament in the world. The sword reflects the duty of the sovereign of the Isle of Man, which protects and defends the Manx people throughout the Tinwald. It's easy to assume that swords are for stabbing people and threatening to stab people, but they can be so much more. If you could get your hands on any of these swords, which one would you arm yourself with and why? Also, check out our other cool stuff showing up on screen right now. See you next time.